Welcome back, and today we're going to continue our discussion of chemistry, it is all that matters, by talking about our periodic table. And there are periodic tables online, and there are periodic tables you can purchase, but we have created a periodic table with all of the materials that we feel you will need for this course. So when I say our periodic table, it is truly our periodic table. So the periodic table you have been given um, on a hard copy, but also there's an HTML version online for your Blackboard. That way you always have the periodic table with you, whether it's in hand, paper form, or whether you have your iPad or, or computer and you can access the Blackboard online. So our periodic table is designed with some very key elements that will help you as a chemistry student. And one of the things that has always bothered me about being a chemistry teacher is whenever I run into someone and tell them I'm a chemistry teacher, the first thing they ask me is, do you have the students memorize the periodic table? Well, memorizing is, number one, not learning, and memorizing, number two, is not being able to use. It's simply having a bunch of knowledge in your head. So we are going to treat our periodic table as a tool, the same way a hammer or saw or a chisel is used by a carpenter or a laser or scalpel is used by a surgeon. It is a tool. And since it is a tool, we will always have it with us so we can use it in the functions of chemistry. So you will probably end up memorizing some of the periodic table simply because of the repetition of use, but we are not going to ask you to memorize the periodic table. What we are going to ask you to figure out is how to use this tool in the most efficient and effective ways to better your understanding of the science of chemistry. In later chapters, we will talk about the history of the periodic table and how the periodic table came about and the people involved in the production of the periodic table but this is just to get you familiar with the periodic table we're going to use for this class but also the basic uh, format of the periodic table so the periodic table represents the physical and chemical behavior of the elements in lines of the periodic table and they are arranged by number and that number is called the atomic number and that atomic number represents the number of protons in each of those elements so it is a very distinct order of the appearance of the elements on the periodic table and because the elements have very similar properties and do very similar things there is actually a repetition of some of those properties so each of the columns which are known as families or groups will have very similar characteristics so let's look at how our periodic table is arranged first of all on our periodic table there is a key there in the center upper region um, and this is an example of what an element box looks like and the number on top tells you the atomic number again that's the number of protons the symbol in the middle is the symbol for the element and that's always a capital letter um, if there are two letters in the symbol it's a capital letter and a lowercase letter so if you see two capital letters in a row that's two different elements um, the name of the element and you'll notice some of the names don't match the symbol and because and that is because some of our elements actually use their Latin name or their Latin symbol and therefore don't quite match up. Um, the mass is what's called an average atomic mass and we'll talk about how to do that and where that number comes from. But if you round that to a whole number, the atomic mass should equal the protons plus the neutrons. So if you add the protons plus the neutrons, you're going to get the atomic mass. And there's a number in the center at the bottom. It's called the electronegativity, and we'll talk about that in a later chapter. And that has to do with how each of these elements bonds in a different way. And the last thing in each of the element boxes is in the lower left corner, you will see a letter either S, L, G, or S. In this case, it's a G, and that tells you whether the element is a solid, liquid, gas, or synthetic in its natural state. Now across the top of the periodic table there are a series of rows and in those rows are a series of numbers, Roman numerals, and different information. So let's talk about what each of those things across the top of the periodic table tell you. And the first thing is the top two uh, rows are the 
column number and the group information. So uh, column number two, group 2A, two and you'll notice that as you go across the periodic table, you have 18 columns and there are um, 18 different groups. So those group numbers come from where they're positioned on the periodic table and how their electrons, which we'll talk about later, are arranged. Um, the third row has two bits of information. First of all, you have the two val means there are two valence electrons. There are two electrons in the outermost air region of the atom and the most common charge of the ion, and we'll talk about ions later as well, and a common charge in this case, the example is plus two, but that could range from uh, plus one to plus four and from minus four down to minus one and you even have a zero for some of the elements. And then the last row on the bottom tells you the orbital group, um, um, which is also called the block of the periodic table. And in this case, we have a S block. There's also a P, a D, and an F. And then the number of electrons in that orbital. So in this case, this is an S orbital with two electrons. So again, this is information, and that would hold true for the entire column of elements. So all of the elements in that column will have this similar um, information about its characteristics and properties. There is a list directly above the orange and yellow section of the periodic table, and the, this list of seven elements are called the diatomics. And uh, this is probably one of the areas of chemistry that students uh, make the most simple mistakes with. And what we have to understand is these elements, when they are in their natural state, when they are in their gaseous state and by themselves, they will always come as a diatomic pair. A diatomic, di meaning two atomic atoms, two atoms in every molecule in their natural state. And each of these is a gas in their natural state. Now we talked about the fact that in the lower left corner there is a letter or a symbol that tells you whether it is a solid, liquid, or gas, but we've also color-coded that for you. And if the symbol of the element is black, that is a solid. If it is blue, that means in its natural state it's a liquid. And in uh, red, that means it is a gas in its natural state and it is synthetic if it is this yellow-orange color. And that is in its natural state at room temperature, which is about 25 degrees Celsius. Now, you'll also notice that our periodic table is quite colorful, and that's because sections of the periodic table are divided by groups or families. Now, groups are columns, and families are elements that share common characteristics. So you'll notice that the colors relate to different groups or families along the periodic table. For instance, that bright pink is an alkali metal. If you go down to the purple, you have the lanthanide transition metals. If you go to yellow, that's the other nonmetals. So in each case, the color represents a group, which is a column of elements that share common characteristics, or it means a block of elements that share a common set of characteristics. Now you will notice on the upper left of your periodic table, hydrogen is in the first row, first column, and it is different in color than the rest of that column. And that's because hydrogen is kind of in its own world. Hydrogen can be a plus one or it could be a minus one. It acts differently in different situations. It is one of the diatomics. It's a gas. Um, so hydrogen is kind of in its own world and has special characteristics that we will talk about throughout the year. So that's why it's colored differently than the rest of the elements in that column. That column, the first column, is called the alkali metals, and it is the first column of the periodic table, and this is called the S1 orbital configuration. Again, it's the S block, and it has one electron in its outermost orbital, and uh, this group of elements will most commonly take on a plus one charge, and these elements are all highly reactive in water, and in fact, some of them will actually explode if um, put in water. The column next to that, in the second column of the periodic table, these are the alkaline earth metals, and these have what is called an S2 orbital configuration. 
That means that it is an S block with two electrons in its outermost shell. And uh, this column of elements typically take on a plus two charge as their most common ion. On the far right, the second column from the right end is the 17th column of the periodic table, and these bright green halogens are what are called P5. This is the P block of orbital configuration, and these hold five electrons in that P block, and they most typically take on a negative one charge, and they are typically used as cleansers, like fluorine for cleaning your teeth, and chlorine for cleaning your pool, and iodine used to clean out wounds at the doctor's office but each of these has their own special characteristic that allows them to do that job. The noble gases, which are the last column on the far right of the periodic table, which is column 18, these are the P6 orbital configuration. Uh, they have six electrons in their outermost shell. That six represents a full outermost shell, which makes these elements very stable. However, if you add energy through electricity, these become very bright and they show color, different colors, and these, this is what creates fluorescent lighting or neon signs. That P block on the right-hand side of the periodic table contains an area of what are called the transition from metals to nonmetals. The yellow elements are all nonmetals including carbon, nitrogen, oxygen, phosphorus, sulfur, and selenium. Uh, carbon, nitrogen, and oxygen, phosphorus, and sulfur are some of the most common elements on the Earth. Then you have an orange region there, and that orange region are called the metalloids because depending on how they are reacting with other elements, they can take on properties of metals or they can take on properties of nonmetals. Now, there is a red zigzag line creating a staircase, and that staircase actually separates the metals from the nonmetals on our periodic table. So everything to the left of that staircase is considered a metal, everything to the right of that staircase is considered a nonmetal, and these orange elements here uh, that hug that staircase actually contain a little bit of both. Then you have the blue region there which are the other metals because in the middle you have this large purple block which are called the inner transition metals. These are the elements we most commonly think of as metals like nickel and zinc and copper and iron and tungsten. So those are the inner transition metals. And then on the very bottom of the periodic table we have what is known as the F block and the F block contains two uh, rows of elements called the lanthanide metals and the actinide metals. And we'll talk about their placement and why they're on the very bottom of the periodic table when we talk about the history of the periodic table later. But uh, you'll see that a lot of these elements are actually synthetics and they are elements made by man. So that is our periodic table, and once again you have a hard copy that has been provided for you, and then you have an HTML version uh, on your uh, Blackboard uh, portal, which will allow you to always have access to the periodic table. And once again, we are not here to memorize the periodic table, we are here to use it as a tool to make our understanding of chemistry more functional, more efficient, and more effective. So hopefully this will give you good insight on what is available on that periodic table and continue to get better at chemistry.